Dun, da, da, da. Okay, so uh, intro to Safer EO. So I like to think of EO as a play, okay? Uh, because the beginning and end are like that. And so here's the cast of characters uh, in order of appearance, okay? We have EO, okay? How do you say his name in English? Job. 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 Okay, good. I've heard people. <laughs> I've heard people give cheer on Eov and say his name is Job. That's, it's, I, I guess it's Job. Yeah, I don't know, but whatever. Okay, so Eov. Uh, then we have his wife, who does not have a name. I call her Betty, because I picture her as this character, <laughs> Betty from the show Mad Men, but that's just my own, my own image. <laughs> but we'll call her Betty, okay. Then we've got uh, Eov's children, uh, who also don't have names, uh, but there are 10 of them. Okay, we'll, we'll probably get to that today. Uh, Eov's servants also don't have names. Uh, the angels. Now, B'nai Elohim literally means sons, sons of God. God, right? Which obviously we don't, we're not that religion. We don't hold that God has a son. Um, but um, it's uh, B'nai Elohim is a name of one of the uh, the 10 categories of angels, okay? And because this is not the name of God, you can say B'nai Elohim. You don't have to say Elohim, right? Um, then Hashem. Okay, and Hashem is actually a character here, which is different than you're used to encountering Hashem in Tanakh, because in Tanakh, usually Hashem is just told about as a reality. Here he's playing a part, which doesn't really sound like it makes any sense right now, but you'll, you'll see what I mean. Like, like he'll say, he'll say uncharacteristically, like, um, uncharacteristically Hashem like things uh, for the sake of the ideas in the book. Okay, so it's like Hashem is like reading lines that are playing the Hashem character. <laughs> that sounds really weird. You'll see what I mean. Okay, then there's the Satan. Okay, uh, not Satan. Again, not, not that religion. Uh, the Satan, which um, you'll, uh, we're going to spend a great deal of time later on in the year explaining who he is, but for now, we'll just encounter him as a character. Um, then there's Eov's buddies, okay? Uh, Eliphaz, the Temani, uh, you know what the English word for Temani is? Yemenite. Yemenite, okay, right? Yemen's been around for a long time. Bildad Hashuchi, I think, I think consensus is Shuchite is a family name, not a location name. Uh, so far, the Naamasite, family name. And then Elihu, uh, the Buzite, not to be confused with Eliyahu Hanavi. Okay, this is Elihu. Okay, those are the characters. Uh, those are his friends, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess you'll judge for yourself whether they act like friends, because uh, they're, not, they're not very friendly, but, uh, uh, but they, they, they are uh, portrayed as his friends. Okay, so as like in a play, there, is a, there are three acts, okay? So act one, I call the question, which is the first three chapters. We're gonna begin with the story of who Eov is, which is what we're gonna do today. Then we have the Satan's challenge, uh, and then Eov's afflictions. And that kind of sets the stage for the main part of the play. The main part of the play is Act Two, the discussion. And this is the only book of Tanakh that takes place in dialogue form, where you have like, and again, this is why I think of it as a play, you have people just conversing, having conversations through the entire book. And there are three rounds of discussion. First round is Eov versus Eliphaz, Bildad, and Sofar on the question of why bad things happen to good people. Second round is, uh, is the same three friends versus Eov on the question of why bad things happen to good people. Third round is Eov versus Eliphaz Bildad. Oh, actually, this is a mistake. It's not supposed to say it so far. I think he drops out actually on both issues. Okay. Then we have the what was the what? The first and second issue. On Tzadik Varalo on why uh, good things happen to bad people. Sorry, why bad things happen to good people. The second issue is why bad things happen to good people. Okay, sorry. That's okay. Um, Oh yeah, obviously, like, I, I'm assuming everyone knows this because you've all been in my classes, but like, feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Like, don't, you know, even more so than in regular high school, because we have no schedule, right? Like, there's no, like, in terms of the, the year's curriculum, we can go, it, you know, we're not trying to, like, hit certain places at certain times. Yeah. Okay, then the answer. Okay, this is the answer you've all been waiting for about, like, why good things happen to bad people and vice versa. Um, I wrote this in the, in the syllabus. The goal is not to answer the question in a absolute definitive way, because, um, Anyone know who asked this question famously? Uh, maybe, maybe, but not the one I was thinking of. Who would you think would know the answer to this Moshe. question? Oh, Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu asked oh, this. He, he asked this question. So there's a, um, there's a midrash that when Moshe says to Hashem, um, when he asked the two requests of, uh, 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 by the Egel, of teach me your ways and show me your glory or your essence, uh, Chazal say that Moshe was asking this question. And what does the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu asked this tell you about the question? No, it's a very difficult question, right? Um, and this is also why I say that if anyone ever tries to answer this question to you simply, then go, theh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> say, say that, that the, if the answer were simple, you would not need a 42-chapter book, and Moshe wouldn't have had to have asked this question. 
he's the greatest Navi, you know? Um, and so, so the goal for us is not to answer it, but it's to gain insight into the question and figure out an approach towards answering the question and ways of thinking about the question. I can't guarantee I'm gonna answer all the questions here. So if like, if that's why you're in the class, then leave now. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, this is where Elihu chimes in, okay? Elihu is the friend, the fourth friend who is younger than the other guys. In fact, he, um, he enters the stage by saying, you guys are a bunch of old senile men who, uh, who don't know what you're talking about. And, uh, and I let you talk first because you're supposed to respect your elders, but clearly none of you knows what's going on. And then he gives his answer. And um, when everyone else gives their answer, Eov responds and like objects. When Elihu gives his answer, Eov has no response and is silent, which means that he, he partially accepts it and he partially doesn't. So then who do you think swoops in to back up Elihu's answer? Hashem, okay, then Hashem comes in, says his version of the answer, which in content is gonna be the same as Elihu's, but it's stated differently. And then we have the epilogue where we found out what happens to Eov after the, after the discussion. Okay, now, in this class, uh, because, I, uh, because of, uh, we wanna save time for Tehillim for the second half of the year, and also because I have not studied the entire Safer in depth, we are going to do these parts of the Safer, which means we're going to leave out rounds two and three. I might bring in isolated lessons from two and three, but we're not going to do them in depth. Uh, that would just take uh, way, too, <laughs> way too long uh, on all of our parts. Um, and so this is the, the plan here. Okay. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the style of class, so you know, in those who were in my Michelet class or in my other Nach classes, um, Michelet, you would say the style is pretty consistent every day, right? Like we're doing the same kind of thing every day. This is not going to be like that, okay? First set of classes, uh, probably for next uh, week or two, is going to feel like story time. Yeah, okay. We're going to have story time. We'll raise questions and stuff, but it's going to feel like reading a story, okay? And we're going to do it in Hebrew. Then what happens is um, Eov goes, uh, after chapter two, Eov switches over into the most difficult Hebrew in all of Tanakh, okay? In fact, many of the words are... Like, it's one of these things where, like, almost every word is disputed what it means. Uh, so we're going to switch to English for the middle of Eov, okay? Um, and that's going to feel like we're going to take entire chapters in English and just try to get the main idea without going into every single Pasuk. Third set of classes is going to be where we go into the Rambam in the more Nevuchim, which is the deep philosophy stuff. Um, and that's going to feel like a, a Jewish philosophy class based in the text, but like, we're going to have a lot, it's going to talk about all the issues of like, you know, what is the definition of evil? Like, how does God do stuff? What is Hashgacha Pratis? All that, that fun stuff. Okay. Then we're going to go back and examine the answer in Sefer Eov back in the text in light of the, um, of the Rambam. And then the epilogue is also going to be story time. Okay. Uh, and that'll take us through the semester. All right. So if the class feels differently at different points, then that's to be expected. All righty. Any questions? Okay. So, all right, we're now gonna do intro to Eov here, all right? So this is background information uh, about the book. So who wrote Safer Eov? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to answer, right? <laughs> okay, anyone who wrote Safer Eov? Hazal, no. Good guess, but no, yeah. It's Hazal. Oh, see, that's how I'm just trying to cheat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, in fact, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to Hannah in a second. <laughs> yeah, anyone know who wrote it? What would you guess the non-intuitive answer is? The, the one that you wouldn't no guess? One. It's a secret. Uh, close, close. So Chazal say that Moshe wrote it, but we don't actually know who wrote it. He wrote it after he asked the question. Yeah. So Chazal say Moshe Rabbeinu wrote it. It's unclear whether they hold that Moshe actually wrote it or whether we attribute it to Moshe because he's the only type of person who could answer this question. You know, for example, um, I don't know if you, I don't know how much Tehillim experience you've had, but have you, are you familiar that there are certain Prakim of Tehillim that begin with like Tefillah Lamosha or like it says different authors? Same Machlokas there is some people say that, that those people actually wrote them and other people just attribute it to them based on like the idea of the contents, not, not because they actually wrote it. Okay. Um, for Tehillim, you mean? Yeah. yeah, so that that's another mach locus. Is the question is those Tehillim that are identified as being having different authors, did were, were were those written by the authors and then passed down and David like transcribed it, or did David write it and it's like in the name of those people? Yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, when did Eov live? Well, if it was written possibly by Moshe, it has to be before Moshe's time. Okay, so one possibility is Moshe's time. Where did you say Ayala? Never. Okay. Fictional. Okay, what else? Anyone? 
guess or hear anything else? Oh, maybe after Fantasio. You're all right. Okay, no, the answer is no one knows, and there's it's a 10-way mock locus, okay, in Bava Basra. I'm just going to show you the opinions just so you can see, like, how, um, what do you call it, how vast these opinions are here. Um, by the way, if you ever want me to slow, again, I'm not expecting everyone to, like, write everything down. These notes are for your own sake, but uh, if you just want me to, like, pause or go back, we can. Just remember that there's a, I'll post this on, online. Um, so uh, when did he, uh, I'll show you the opinion, the 10 way opinions in a second. When did he live and was he Jewish? Those are the questions three and four. Uh, you want to guess the answer based on the pattern so far? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, the, so there are 10 views and based on the 10 views, there are different possibilities. So uh, view number one is in the days of Yitzchak Avinu, two in the days of Yaakov Avinu, three days of Yosef. Okay. Uh, uh, before Moshe. Oh, I mean, yeah. Okay. okay. Four in the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. Five is in the time of the Miraglim, which is also the days of Moshe Rabbeinu, but it's like in the Midbar. Uh, six, the days of the Shoftim, which is about, uh, I'm trying to calculate the years. Well, we know that the Shoftim period like started after Yoshua went to the land. Uh, the days of David, much, much later. And then at the end of Galus Babel, or in the time of Ahasuerus. <laughs> okay, and then the 10th opinion is what Ayala said. Uh, the way that Gemara says it, lo haya velo nivra, which means Eov never existed, and the story didn't actually happen. So according to these views, right, one through four, uh, and I, I, I'm including four in that because days of motion means like before Matan Torah and all that stuff. So then Eel was definitely not Jewish because there were no Jews back then. All right. If it was five through nine, then he might've been Jewish. He might've not been Jewish. And 10 is he didn't exist. Okay. It's just a muscle. All of you is just a muscle, which means either it's a muscle of a Jewish man or a not Jewish man. We don't know. So the answer is we don't know. Okay. So, Given all of this, what, 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 what might start bothering you about the Sefer? Well, can we not? So how does our answer if we don't know Yeah, about is, it? is the, oh, sorry. I, I jumped ahead of myself. Okay, <laughs> I, I forgot I delved into this part. Okay, so before, hold on to that. So what are the arguments for each side about whether, um, whether I want to say each side, if you had to divide these into two teams, what would be the two clear teams? Jewish and Nope. Uh, did it happen? Did it ha is it a real event or like is it a real person or not? Right. Basically, one through nine is teaming up against ten. Okay. And then within within team one through nine, then there's two opinions okay. here. Yeah. So what are the arguments for each side? So this is from the um, raw bog. Okay. And and I'll show you the text and then I'll summarize it in bullet points. Okay. Um, uh, anyone want to read English? Yeah. Go ahead. I believe that he and the rabbis have said that this narrative is a parable was moved to make this assertion because he observed the logical precision found in the discussion, which follows the ways of exhaustive analysis and does not omit even one of the contradictory phrases of the argument. Yeah. There you go on. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. held that these opinions were not really uttered by actual disputants. Yeah. Because it seems strange to him that their opinion should correspond to the number of, of phases which are discerned by an exact logical division of an argument. So this is fancy raw buggy and yeah, like <laughs> long sentences. Yeah, yeah. It, did anyone catch what he said and say it in their own words? Yeah, yeah that was mentioned. Okay, good, good. So it is, uh, this is arguing for the side that it's a muscle, which is the dialogue in the Sefer is exactly in line with all of the logical parts of the argument and it's in perfect order. Okay, and it seems that therefore it seems too perfect to be a real discussion. Okay, it's like if you, um, I mean, like, uh, what would be an example of this? Like, let's say, like, you know how Wikipedia articles have like an outline at the very beginning of them and it's all organized by topic and in order? It'd be like if we all had a discussion here and our discussion went in exactly the order of the outline and was perfectly like arranged, you know, it's just unlikely that it's a real discussion. Okay. Um, see if you can anticipate what might be an argument that he was a real person. Okay. So many details. What do you mean by so many details? Yeah. Okay. Good. That's one argument. How would you address, how, what would be a counter argument to this, to this point that it seems too perfect to be real? Oh, that is a that is a good possibility, right? Maybe the discussion happened in a natural way, but then when they wrote it down, they presented it. He actually doesn't mention that, but I think that's a good argument. What what's another counter argument to this? That could be also. So here's what he says. Uh, I like you read again. Yeah. On the other hand, the one who said that this is an actual happening 
forces you by the fact that the prophet Yehuzkel mentions Noah, Daniel, and Eel. Furthermore, it is not impossible that the opinions of men in a discussion should correspond to the number of phases which logical judgment can discern. Therefore, the one who holds this opinion did not think it impossible that this narrative relates to an actual. So, so these are two arguments. What is the first argument he's saying here? That it happened at a time when people were like at the level to have like a perfect argument. Oh, uh, so that's the second argument he's making, right? That's uh, paragraph two. Yeah. Yeah, right, but you're, you're right, you're right. So, so we'll just go out of order here, right? So the second argument he's making is, it is possible to have a discussion that follows perfect logical order, right? Like if you have people who are thinkers, who are chachamim, they will approach the subject in order. So even though it's unlikely, it is possible. And now what's his first opinion about Noah, Daniel, and Eov? He's talking about like, as if, like, as if it's another person, just like Noah, Daniel, and Eel. Exactly, right? So we know that Noah is a real person. We know that Daniel was a real person. It would be weird, and, and Yechezkel is mentioning them as examples of, of like prominent people within the context of like God's righteousness or, their, or people's righteousness. So it'd be weird to mention them. Like, like if, if I said, for example, you know, among the great figures in American history are Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Mickey Mouse, it would be very, be very weird because Mickey Mouse like might be a great figure, but just not in that same category, right? Okay, uh, and then he goes on and mentions one more point. Uh, last point for you. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So um, point number one is that uh, Yechezkel mentions Eov in the same context as Noah and Daniel, since they're real people and he's using them as examples. It makes sense that Eov is also a real person. Yeah. Okay. One more point, uh, Ayla. Another proof that it is a narrative of something which actually took place is the fact that the author gives numerous particulars, such as the name of you, the name of the cities of his residence, the number of his properties, and that of his sons, at the beginning and at the time of the end of the book, and the names of his daughters, also that their father bequeathed to them mm -hmm. an inheritance together with their brothers, as well as the names of his friends and their genealogy. All of these descriptions are of a kind that are given in true stories to support belief in their veracity. Yeah, okay, so this is what you said, right? Uh, so basically, all the details uh, lend themselves to the argument that these are real people. Um, let me just put this on the uh, summary bullet points, and then I'll, I'll elaborate on that point. So Robach's arguments that he's real are, Eov is mentioned in Tanakh alongside Noah and Daniel, who were real. It's not impossible for real discussion to follow this perfect order. And three, the Sefer has lots of details, and it wouldn't be necessary for a mushal. Now, you might object to that, Anyone have an objection to point number three? You can make up, from you can make up a lot of details, right? If any of you have, uh, you know, are fans of fiction reading, right, or or movie lore, you know, there's lots of details. Like if you go into like uh, whatever, like any any you know Harry Potter, X Men, whatever, like there's lots and lots of details about about uh, about those people, you know, even though they're not real. So um, so that anyone know what he might mean then? I mean, like that that makes it seem like this is a weak argument. Ah, so I, you're right, I kind of put part of my answer in there. It wouldn't be necessary for a muscle, um, but there's another, anyone have another uh, possible answer? This one, I, I couldn't figure out on my own. I had to like read somewhere. But. Maybe it would be necessary for a muscle. Okay, one, I mean, it is possible that you have a very detailed muscle where every single detail signifies something. That's, that is definitely true. There are muscle in like that. So the answer, um, I, I just happen to know this from the raw bog in other areas of his commentary. He says that the style of writing in those times was if you are giving lots of details, then you're, it's a real event. Meaning the fiction style back then was such that people did not write elaborate um, details in their fiction. I think the only example you might know of is how many of you like at some point in your childhood have like read Greek mythology? Ish? Jackson. No, no, no. That's a novel. <laughs> I'm saying like, no, I mean, I think that's where a lot of people are exposed to Greek mythology. But like, if you hear, or here's another example. Um, uh, he's, uh, I was going to say his name. Aesop's Fables, Aesop's Fables, like the boy who cried wolf. Have you heard of the boy who cried wolf? Yeah. Have you ever heard a version of the story where they say his name and how many siblings he had and like where he lived and how rich his father was? No, right? Because the purpose of a fable is just to convey the idea. So the Robog's argument is, is that uh, if Eo were a fable, it would be told in that style. And the fact that it gives all these details means that it's not a fable, it's an actual historical account. Okay? Now, we have the question I asked before, is if we don't know who wrote it, when it was written, or whether it actually happened, how can we rely on it? 
or learn from it. Uh, who, I think when I asked this question, you said authority would be the problem. Like, how could we trust it? Yeah, I said that. Oh, you said I, I can't tell because of masks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how can we rely on it? Chazal, though, they they talked about it. So well, I'll ask the question on Chazal, which is how could they rely on it? Mm. Mm. Right. I mean, you. Uh, let, me just, let me just give Leah more credit here. You're right. Is that we can trust it because Chazal trusted it. But my question still stands, which is how did they trust it if they didn't necessarily know all this stuff? Maybe they read it and they agreed with what they said. Right. Bingo. Okay, so it must be that the ideas in Sefer Eov have to be assessed on their own merit. Okay, and I'll give you two examples you're familiar with. If you found a math book and you did not know who the author was, but the math made sense, you would accept it. Mm -hmm. Similarly with Mishlei, right? Those who learned Mishlei last year, um, if you saw a Mishlei Pasuk and you thought about it and the idea made sense, you wouldn't say, well, I'm not going to accept it unless I know who the author is, right? No, it, it, the, the content should be judged on its own. So same thing here, okay? And that's why this is in Ksuvim instead of Nevi'im, because this is not relying on the authority of Navua. This is, you know, in, in, at least according to the Rambam, Nevi'im, the only things that were included in Nevi'im or things said with Navua, um, stuff in Ksuvim was Ruach HaKodesh, or just Chachma, like Shlomo HaMelech wrote Mishle just with his Chachma, according to most. Um, so, so even if this is just Chachma, then the ideas are, are there to be judged on their own, okay, not relying on prophetic authority. Um, so that's really where Chazal come in, right, is that there, we're not going to assess this on our own, but Chazal deemed it uh, reliable and that the ideas were in line with Torah, and we just, in terms of the way we learn stuff in general, we rely on Chazal that they knew what they were talking about. Yeah, but this answers how they, they, they knew it. Okay, I actually think that this is a good place to stop uh, because the period's almost over. Oh, sorry, is it? Wait, what am I saying? No, it's not. Wait. Sorry, no, what am I saying? <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right, good. So we can, we, think we can actually go on and start the first five so again, okay? Uh, uh, this is the, in the story time thing here. Take one, pass it on, take one, pass it, uh, actually, I'll take one, and you pass the rest on. Does anyone else like cold? Yeah. I'd rather be cold. Is anyone like hot to the point where like, you'd be yeah. really upset if I turned off? I mean, I don't really care. We'll turn them on if we we'll get Yeah, I, I, I side with the Allah. I'm not oh, you're talking to the fans, or is there? An, I Wait, feel like there's an actual air conditioner. Like, no, 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 yeah, no, no, but we—I don't know. If, what was that? Oh. oh, here you go. Pass one down. Yeah, I think so. Also, yeah, I don't. I, I doubt this is going to make it really yeah. cooler. I think it's just going to make it more stagnant in the air, and that's not going to be good. Sorry. <laughs> guess I have to. Guess the, in, in, in true shall have it fashion, we'll have to bring a uh, you know warm uh, coats. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, who would like to begin the first pasuk of Eo? Leah, go ahead. Okay. Ishaya, a man was. Yeah. The earth's Uts, and a man in the land of Uts. Yep. Eos. Like the potato chips. <laughs> oh, actually, I, I that. Uh, yeah. I know it's us. Yeah, it reminds me, though. It reminds me. I'm going to interrupt you here. Uh, the Rambam says something a little um, weird here. I, I think it's weird. He says, uh, what, what Hebrew word does Uts remind you of? Like, what common. A uh, okay, eight is one. What about Eitsa, which means advice. advice? Okay, so Ramam says that this is like code for telling you that the whole thing is a mushal, that he was living in the land of counsel, in the land of advice, meaning that this is not meant to be taken literally. I don't think the Ramam is deriving that from the word Uts because there was an actual land of Uts, um, but like that's that's what the Ramam says. So I just wanted to convey that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Yoshimo, what's his name? Yeah, that, and he was, and that man was. Yeah, now here comes words that are a little harder to, to translate. Tom was the one who's... So in the Haggadah, Tom means simple, um, in, uh, which means like not as intelligent as the Chacham, right? This is not necessarily what it means. You know what Tom means when you're talking about like, uh, like as a praise of someone? Each time, yeah, like Yaakov each time. Yeah, so what does it mean there? Uh, close, close. Simple still has like a negative worldly. connotation. What was that? Like uh, not really worldly. So uh, I'll give you another hint. If you've learned Vayikra, when you say a behema that is uh, tamima. No blemishes. No blemishes. Okay, good. So wholesome is the English word that corresponds to that. I like saying blemish free because the, the meaning is without a negative. Okay, so no, ble no blemishes. Um, yashar. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Straight. 
Yeah, straight or uh, our school likes upright, but, but uh, um, which I, I'm fine with also, right? But the, literally me straight. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. And he turned away from, from bad. Okay, good. Okay, so those are the qualities that Eov has described with, and he's described with this in several times throughout the book. Now, knowing what you know about the book, that this is about why bad things happen to good people, uh, do you notice anything missing from this list that you might expect to be on the list? Yeah. Tzadik, right? I mean, good also, but Tzadik would really be, if the book is about Tzadik Rallo, it doesn't say Tzadik, right? What other, like, uh, praiseworthy, in, when, we, when we praise people in Judaism for, like, their level, what other common praises do you see? Chacham, right? Doesn't say Chacham. Uh, right, I mean, Navon is another, pra another praise. What about, like, uh, you see, when you see Yirei Elohim, what missing term comes to mind? God-fearing, oh, God. but not lo God-loving. Okay, good, right. So, so, so it does not say Tzadik, it does not say Chacham, and it doesn't say he loved God. Okay, this will be relevant later on, but I wanted to quickly comment on that. Um, the Ramam and the Mor Nebuchim, um, anyone want to try translating this? It's a little bit more difficult Hebrew. Oh, by the way, unless you want me to, and you can tell me in private, I'm not going to call on people to read. I will just take volunteers. Okay, that way, like, we don't have to put anyone on the spot. But if you do want to improve your, your reading, and you want me to force you to improve your reading, then ask me, like, in private, and I, I can call on you. Okay, I just think that that's, that's the best system for, for this class. Yeah. yeah, Emily, go ahead. Oh, wait, no, I, I want to try. Oh, you have a question. Oh, no, 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 we're going to go a little bit into the Ram I'm here. Anyone want to read? All right, I'll read. He says, Vahayoser mufla utmuha, the most wondrous and astounding thing, or more wondrous and astounding thing, Bechol hasha'ila hazo, in this entire question, this entire inquiry, Shlotir as Eov bechachma, is that Eov is not uh, attributed or ascribed, described with chachma. Below Amar ish chacham, oh, he says what you said, Ayala, o mevin, o maskiel, right? It doesn't say man of understanding or intelligence. Elatiro bimaala midosis. You want to take a stab at what what ma'ala midos is? Good midos, right? Is 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 good character traits? Biyosher ma'asim. And good actions, upright actions. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so in other words, like all those four terms that we just read, are are just good midos. None of them are described in chachma. Okay. So Eov was a very morally good person, ethically good. Okay. Nice guy, but uh, but not necessarily having chachma. And the Raman brings a proof of this. Or an argument, I should say. The matter would not be difficult upon him, as will be explained. Okay, meaning that Eov would not have had the same questions or the same reactions or the same difficulties as we're going to see that he has. Okay. That's that is for uh, for us to answer later on. Okay, because Ram is just saying it wouldn't have been as harsh on him. The question is, does it mean like his reaction wouldn't have been as harsh, or like the stuff wouldn't have happened that that is harsh? Okay, um, but for now, what we get from this is the idea that uh, that Eov was good in his midos, but not necessarily in his chachma. I also want to add, if you read later on in the book, it'll be clear that he is a chacham in the sense that he he disproves all of the arguments of his friends. But when the Ramam says Chacham, he means that he lacked knowledge of God and how God's actions are and God's, God's ways. Okay, meaning he was an intelligent guy, but he wasn't a Chacham in relation to the way God runs the world or, or ideas about God. It is very specific, yeah. I mean, the, if you want an analogy here, there are lots of scientists nowadays uh, who are very great Chacham in their science, in their area of science or mathematicians or philosophers, but when it comes to to like theology and religion and metaphysics, they just are are idiots. <laughs> you know, like they're not they don't know what they're talking about, but they think that they know. And that's kind of uh, how you should picture Eo. Very intelligent in his areas, but and and good mitos, but not knowledgeable about God. Okay. All right. Uh, I also wanted to mention a side point, which I will just paraphrase here, um, which is uh, so this is in the the Ramam's laws of actually I, I don't, we're not rushing. Not rushing. Different, <laughs> different, different world. Then, see, I'm used to teaching this once a week, and shall have it, and like gotta, you know, move it. Move it otherwise, like, uh, yeah, um, I won't say. Um, so, uh, <laughs> this is in the context of um, what do you call it? Uh, when someone wants to convert to Judaism, there are certain things that the basin has to tell him. Okay, um, so uh, him or her. modin also onchan Just like you tell them the punishment of the mitzvos, kaf modin also scharon also You also tell them the reward for the mitzvos. Umodin also shabasias mitzvos elu, 
Yizkel Chai Olam Haba. You have to tell them that when they do these mitzvahs, they'll get Olam Haba. Okay, and this is the important point. You have to tell them, the, uh, see if you can translate this. She'in sham tzadik gamur ela bal chachma. Yep. Yeah, yeah. The, exactly. There's no such thing as a complete tzadik except someone who possesses a chachma. She'osim mitzvahs elu v'yodaan. Who does these mitzvahs and knows them. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is not what um, the Mepharshim say on Eov, but my theory is that Eov was righteous in terms of his actions, but the thing that prevented him from being uh, righteous was his lack of Chachmah. Okay, that's why he's not described as righteous. Okay, in other words, if you look at all of his actions and his dealings with people, he does everything right, but he just doesn't have this Chachmah that would qualify him as a, uh, as a type. Emily, you want to read on in the story? <laughs> sure. Yeah, born to they were born to him. Yeah. Um seven boys and three girls. Yep, seven seven sons seven and sons, three daughters. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay, good. So he's got ten children. Okay. Um, and I'll just tell you right off the bat, you're gonna realize these are adult children, okay, by the time the safer starts. Okay. Uh you wanna do another one? This one's got weird words, but I'll help you with them. Okay. Um yeah, yeah, so you know what, mikneh? Cattle. Cattle, right? So here, uh, usually it does mean cattle. Here it's going to mean livestock because it's going to say other types of farm animals. Uh, so shivas al Seven. Seven, um, eight. Not seven. Seven, al Oh, thousand. S- seven thousand Ooh, sheep. He's, he's a rich man. Yeah, okay, good, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so semen means pairs of. Oh, so Yeah, so what would be? Yeah, so five hundred pairs of oxen. Um, and five hundred. Yeah, donkeys. She donkeys to be specific. Also knows, right? Yeah. Yeah, here avuda. Uh, yeah, so it, this is a noun. So here, avuda um, is uh, produce or like, um, it's talking about like agricultural produce, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, behold, fine. Yeah. yeah, so what do you think means gadol mikol bnei kadam? It doesn't mean he's physically larger, right? Ah. So it literally means greater, but the Mepharshim say means he was richer or more prominent, okay, than all the people in the East. So this, not only was he rich, but he was rich and famous. Uh, if anyone wants fake extra credit, uh, I offer this every year when I teach this class on this Pasuk, okay. Um, in fact, I'll give you as much fake extra credit as you want, okay. Um, if anyone wants to calculate the average price, if you wanted to buy a sheep today, okay, and if you wanted to buy a camel, if we could figure out how much Eov's net worth would be today, that would give you an idea of like how rich this guy was. But you already have the number. Very rich. I already what? You're saying you already have the number? Uh, I don't. I look it up every year um, after like if, if, if anyone like thinks that they know, but uh, we're not going to do that now. <laughs> yeah, okay. But it's just, I mean, if, if you think about it, like a cow is probably pretty expensive, right? Uh, and, you know, and if you look at, I mean, this is like, this is crazy. This is like. Where does he fit it? Yeah. In his yeah, ark. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, he's got, he's probably, well, yeah, that's actually a good question. What can you infer about where he fits this? What does he also probably own a lot of? Land. Property, land. 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 Exactly, right, you got it all, yeah, right, right, yeah. Okay, um, and obviously the, the, the calculation will be speculative. We don't know how much these things were worth back then, but that's why, you know, if we get it now. Yeah, yeah, real fake extra credit, yeah. Okay, uh, two more Pesukim, uh, and then we'll be done with our intro. Uh, Wants to take the next one? Yeah, go ahead, Ayala. Yep. Yeah, so what this means at each other, at each one's house on his day, meaning uh, they had a rotation and we're gonna assume, oh yeah, yeah, go on actually, we'll, we'll find out what we assume. And they sent and called. Yep. Yeah, good. So whose houses were these people going to? The, 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 the sons, right? 
Yeah, the brothers, right? So, so each of the sons, there were seven sons corresponding to each one of the days, and they would have family, a family feast or family party uh, each of the days, and they're and they invite their sisters. It is nice, right? You could so you could tell this family was was very close uh, close with each other. Okay, good. Now, who is absent from these parties? Eo. The mom is a good question. Maybe the mom also. I, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, this is another reason why I think that it's uh, that it's not literal because the mom just comes in for one line. Okay, like uh, she's not described as like a real person. Okay. Um, so uh, who wants to take the last uh, pause for the day? Yeah. I will because we don't have time. But he he kifu yimamish that when the feast days had cycled, meaning when they got to the end of each week, vayshlach iov vayikadshem iov would send for and uh, and prepare them. Uh, or invite them, I guess. The Hishkin Baboker, he would get up early in the morning, the Hela Olos Mispar Kulam, and offer sacrifices corresponding to the number of all of them. Now, I don't remember, I don't know what you guys learn in Vayikra. Do you remember what kind of, uh, 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 sorry, what, what you bring an Ola for? I mean, there's lots of things, but like, did you learn any specific thing that you bring an Ola for? As opposed to, say, for example, a chatas. And I'm not asking, like, what kind of animal. I'm saying, like, what would... Can you describe the olas for I'll give you a hint. Chatas, you bring for an unintentional sin. Nope. There are no korbanos for uh, purposeful, or mostly no korbanos for purposeful sins. They're sins of your mind. Yeah, sins of your mind. Good. Nice memory. Yeah. Okay. So he says like this. Ki amar io, because io said, ulai chatu banai. What does that mean? Oh, yeah. Maybe my son sinned. Uberhu Elohim Bilvavam and blessed God in their hearts. Okay, and you'll, I put quotation marks here. You'll see why in a second. Kaha Yase Eov Koyamim. This is what Eov did all the days. Now, do you know what it means, blessed God in their hearts? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So, um, uh, let me just quickly go to this. Uh, I'll go back. Yeah, uh, every week. Um, so uh, the Matus Tion, which is uh, on the, the source, he says, blessed is Lashon Kinoi Klape Mala. It's a euphemism, right? You don't want to say the word cursed in relation to God, so you say blessed. Okay, so going back to the puzzle here. So in your own words, what was Eov's, what was Eov's concern and what did he do? It is on the end, on the end. On the end. <laughs> Un unintentionally. <laughs> yeah. Sinned, um, in their head and he wanted to Exactly. Now, just uh, uh, first impression. What impression do you get of Eov for the fact that he did this? He wants to be a good guy. Okay, that's definitely good, true. He wants to be a good guy. Anyone else get any other impression? This is a subjective question. A little paranoid. A little. Okay, good. That's my impression. Also, it's a little <laughs> bit religiously paranoid, right? He's. It's not that he's bringing korbanos for himself. It's not that he's bringing korbanos for his son's actual sins. It's maybe they sinned and therefore I'm bringing corbels for all of them. Now he has animals to spare, right? But like if you saw uh, uh, like a modern day mother or father do this, you'd be like a little bit of a helicopter parent deal going on here. Okay, so you're good. Wasting, you're wasting animals and also maybe like a carbon levatola. Um, no, because this is uh, for a, a maybe a possibility. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Right. Okay, so let's stop. We got a break now, and then we'll we'll do English. Yeah. yeah.